morning. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar on the Evidence-Based Neonatal Caregiving Review. We are really pleased this morning to have Kara Ann Waitsman and Shannon Usher as our faculty presenters. Kathy Randall is also online with us to provide technical support, which hopefully we won't need, and to assist with answering questions at the end. So a little bit about our faculty. Kara Ann has been a neonatal therapist for almost 30 years in a large Level 3 NICU and serves as the nursery's developmental specialist. She is president of Creative Therapy Consultants, founder of the Neonatal Touch and Massage Certification, and co-founder of Infant Driven Feeding. She is certified in NTMC and NIDCAP, is pediatric neurodevelopmental therapy trained, and earned the Neonatal Developmental Care Specialist designation. She served on A1's Continuum of Care Advisory Board, NANCE Professional Collaborative, and the March of Dimes Program Services Board. Carrie Ann is an internationally sought-after speaker, educator, and consultant, has, has published articles on positioning and feeding, and written a chapter on neurodevelopmental, neuromotor development and massage. Our co-presenter today, Shannon Usher, received her Master of Science in Occupational Therapy degree from Washington University School of Medicine. She recently moved from a large NICU in Dayton, Ohio, to Children's Hospital Colorado and Colorado Springs. Shannon is a clinical consultant with Creative Therapy Consultants and also served as an integral part of a National Institute of Health research, research study examining the effects of fetal exposure to cytomegalovirus on developmental outcomes. Shannon maintains her neonatal touch and massage, massage certification and is a certified examiner of the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development, the third edition. So welcome, Carrie Ann and Shannon, and I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to get us started. Well, thank you for that introduction, Kathy. And thank you, everyone, for joining Karen and I this morning for our presentation, Evidence-Based Neonatal Caregiving Review. These are our disclosures and the objectives that we will meet during our presentation today. I want to take a quick second to thank all the researchers who are responsible for finding the information that Kara and I are going to present to you today. As clinicians, we know that evidence-based caregiving is truly the root of what we need to be doing. However, staying up to date with all of that information can be really challenging and time consuming. So that's what we're hoping we can make easier for you today. We quickly found after doing our literature review over the last you know, four years that there's a ton of research. So we've selected a small percentage of what's available to you to help point you in the right direction in utilizing research in your daily caregiving practice. Uh, we also just wanted to remind you, you know, each of these articles have the findings that we'll present, but then of course there are limitations and populations that may not be directly applicable to each and every NICU. We'll provide guidelines and themes, and so that you'll be able to then apply them to your specific NICU um, so that it can really help start you know, a new neuroprotective project. So our first section is going to be all about the neuroscience of the preterm infant. Early life exposure predicts later life outcomes. The study that you see listed below um, evaluated the association of the in uterine experience and its effect on later health outcomes. What the researchers determined was that it was truly those epigenetic mechanisms that underlie the ability of predicting later life outcomes. And those epigenetic modifications, what happens is they're operating as an on-off switch. And so different exposures then, um, again, are turn those modifications on or off and they regulate then gene expression. And what was interesting was in that article, they actually identified uh, an epigenetic biomarker that was associated with premature birth. And so, you know, what does all that mean? And what it means is that during your assessment, you're not only affecting the physiological stability of the premature baby you're working with during that assessment, but then 10 minutes later, you're also affecting their first feeding experience. Five weeks later, their ability to roll over or sit up five months later, and their executive functioning five years later as they're entering into kindergarten. When we're evaluating the brain structure and function, the first article I wanted to touch on um, was um, released just here in 2015. And what they did was they recruited a group of children at six years of age, and they categorized those children into three different groups. 
they were either born less than 28 weeks postmenstrual age, they were born um, moderately premature with intrauterine growth restriction, or they were um, just born moderately premature, and that group actually served as the controls. And what they found after MRI imaging was that the infants born less than 28 weeks postmenstrual age or with intrauterine growth restriction had less well-organized global networks and myelination, and they had a lower resting state connectivity and white matter maturation. They also had reduced ability to create dense communication in their brain, which we know is the most efficient type of communication. And so seeing major structural changes, and then what was also interesting is the developmental follow-up that they did at six years of age, those that same group, so less than 28 weeks or intrauterine growth restricted, um, they that less or I'm sorry, that lower resting state connection that persisted um, into that childhood and as did um, their findings that the children had deficits in executive functioning. The next two articles, um, so they used functional MRI to evaluate the brain, again, that resting state. And so that resting state connection has been used to show abnormalities in cerebral development consequent to premature birth. And that's because the low level idling activity of a resting brain actually gives the readout of its working connections. So in the Smyther article, uh, MRIs were completed with 25 term infants within the first week of their life and 25 preterm infants that were born between um, 23 to 29 weeks and the MRIs were completed at term equivalent. And the researchers determined that those babies born between 23 and 29 weeks gestation, that resting state connection um, was less complex compared to their term equivalents. And, um, or I'm sorry, can, uh, compared to their term counterparts. And then the Bama article, what they did was they followed um, 95 preterm infants and 83 full-term infants and looked at that same um, resting state connection with MRI imaging at 26 years old and found that, in fact, that reduced complexity does persist into adulthood. So we truly are seeing structurally and functionally differences in preterm brains compared to those brains of babies that are born term. When we look at the impact of stress and pain in the NICU, unfortunately, they're all too common between you know, intubations and blood gases or you know, pick lines. A preterm baby is expo exposed to you know, more painful procedures than I think any of us would want to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The Coestra article that UC listed was a literature review that um, described the paradigms that define the stress response. And the authors discuss how stress is actually typically a, a productive response, where your body goes into different adaptive behaviors and cellular responses to you know, counteract the stressor. The catch becomes when you have repeated stress. And so repeated stress actually can result in further organ deterioration. So pain and stress in the NICU is not just related to you know, sensory processing um, that we may initially think of, but it actually can contribute to further organ dysfunction, which then in turn causes more painful medical procedures. The Valerie article was another lit review that linked pain and neurodevelopmental outcomes. And that study determined that, that infants that were born less than 29 weeks had in fact greater painful procedures, which we may assume, um, but they also then, it was associated with delayed postnatal growth and um, poor early neurodevelopment and high cortical activation. And um, when they did developmental follow-up at one year of age, those painful procedures were associated with poor cognitive and motor development. So not only are we seeing an issue with our you know, physiological function, but then our neurodevelopmental outcomes as we progress forward. This leads easily into our neurodevelopmental outcome section. So this article was really interesting um, in that they compared the survivability and developmental outcomes for babies born between 22 and 24 weeks postmenstrual age. And they compared a group that was born um, between 1998 and 2004, and then 2005 and 2011. And they completed developmental follow-up with all of those babies between 17 to 25 months corrected age. And when they compared the two groups, what they found was there was improved survivability, actually by 15%, and there was improved developmental outcomes, um, that was by 20%. So great progress, but what was really interesting was that 
of those um, of that later group, despite the improvement, there were actually 47% of those preterm infants still had neurodevelopmental issues during their follow-up. So while we're making great progress, we still have a long way to go. This article um, I wanted to touch on because it reviews um, the impact of late to moderately preterm birth on neurodevelopmental outcomes. So it's not just about extreme prematurity or extremely low birth weight. So this article, they defined late to moderately preterm as 32 to 36 weeks postmenstrual age. And what they found was that those infants are at double the risk for neurodevelopmental disability at two years of age compared to their term counterparts. So how often do we see that 34 or 35 weeker that gets admitted for a feeding issue and then spends three or four weeks in the NICU as we wait for them to get it together? Or that 33 week wimpy white boy who you know, has events for the next month that delayed his discharge. I think that this article really highlights that these, this group of infants are still very volatile and at a high risk for neurodevelopmental issues. And so as neonatal caregivers, what can we do to help you know, protect their neurodevelopment as much as we would a 23 week baby? Lastly, this um, article actually goes into, you know, how do we know which babies are going to have issues or which ones aren't? And what they determined was that you could predict the um, negative neurodevelopmental outcomes by age five by four main predictors. And those were medical complications at birth, maternal education, early motor assessments, and early cognitive assessments. And what I found fascinating about that was one in four predictors of later life outcomes is maternal education. You know, so what can we do as neonatal caregivers to make sure that we're connecting with each and every mom in our, our nursery, making sure that they understand neuroprotective care, that they're able to accurately and consistently interpret their infant's cues, that they understand safe feeding practices or that they know developmental progression for when they go home. I find sometimes it's interesting, you know, when we think, that we've taught the same piece of information, perhaps it's you know, understanding their infant's stress cues, a hundred times. And so we feel like everyone should know that information by now because we've said it a hundred times. But the truth is that is the first time that new mom or mom of five who has their first preterm infant has really heard that information. So as we get into the clinical application of this, truly we're seeing differences in brain structure, brain function, gene expression. We know that that is greatly impacted by the infant's pain, stress, and their environment. And so while we're getting better and better at neuroprotective care, we still, you know, neurodevelopmental outcomes or neurodevelopmental issues, excuse me, are still too prevalent. Um, and this is where we as truly passionate neonatal caregivers have the opportunity through our caregiving practices, our leadership and role modeling to, you know, really educate parents and staff on, you know, how we can protect the babies. So how are we going to do that? And that's going to be through the environment of care. Um, so we'll go into different sections here to kind of um, give you clinical application of what you can do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first one we'll touch on is non-pharmacological approaches to reducing stress. The PANDI article that you see listed here reviews the role of sucrose and reducing pain. It was a double-blinded randomized controlled trial, and they actually utilized sucrose when inserting an OG tube and found that, in fact, those PIP scores were significantly lower when sucrose was offered. What I found interesting with this article was that they were inserting an OG tube, which, you know, many would think of as more of a daily caregiving activity as opposed to innately painful activity. So really, you know, where can we use sucrose um, appropriately? The non article was an integrative literature review that found that there is actually a synergistic effect when you combine sucrose with non-nutritive sucking. So not just giving the baby sucrose, but then giving them their pacifier to suck on as well. The HO article was a randomized controlled trial that compared or looked at the um, PIP scores, the um, oxygen saturation and heart rate of babies um, when they were swaddled during a heel stick and found that in fact they were significantly lower when the babies were swaddled. And the Hartley article was a meta-analysis that found that facilitated tuck does reduce an infant's pain response, and it is appropriate to use as early as 23 weeks. 
And lastly, the Weber article here, um, this is a pretty dense article. So if you're bored on a Saturday night, maybe this would <laughs> interest you. Um, but it discussed neural pathways and the response to positive and negative stimuli. And one area the article really stressed was that um, there's a positive reinforcement loop the brain makes when skin to skin with their mom and how this position, it actually interferes with negative brain loops and how the smell of their mom and being and hearing their heart rate and being on their chest actually counteracts negative exposure, um, painful and stressful exposure. So what are we gonna do with this information? Um, really, when we get into sucrose, are you familiar with your policies in your nursery and the recommended use? And when was that policy last updated? You know, are we, and, and is everyone familiar with it? In terms of facilitated tuck, you know, it's a great alternative for babies when perhaps skin to skin may not be medically possible, um, which we know is very rare, but still a great alternative. Or babies under phototherapy are having constant billy, you know, um, heel sticks to look at their billy rubin levels. You know, offering a hand on the baby's head and bottom, there is a great way to counteract that constant lab procedure. Swaddling, of course, is easy. Non-nutritive sucking, encouraging maternal presence and holding. I, myself and Carrie, and we'll talk about this multiple times today, but having moms present and with their baby is such a big, makes such a big difference in those neurodevelopmental outcomes for the baby. And then massage is a great um, alternative as well, and we'll get into that section later. Progressing into NICU design, there's a few articles here you can see. The Lester article, um, show that single family rooms um, do improve uh, medical and neural behavioral outcomes, that maternal involvement and psychosocial status improve, that there's improved family-centered care, developmental support, um, all offered within the NICU of um, when you've got a, a single family room. The Pineda article, it was a prospective longitudinal cohort study that um, amongst many things did find that at two years of age, infants in private rooms had lower language scores and a trend toward lower motor scores, which had start to bring into question, you know, what we can do as neonatal caregivers to counteract that. The Church article was just published in 2016 and further an, um, analyzed the Pineda findings with a retrospective cohort study. And um, what they found was actually in their particular study, they didn't have a difference in neurodevelopmental outcomes comparing a group of babies that were in open day design to single family rooms. Um, the authors had suggested that that may be related to um, governmental support of parental paid time off. Um, this study, I should say, was competed in Canada, so they, they do have that option. And they also within their nursery, there is a very, very strong promotion of parental presence. And so that they thought that that was actually the confounding variable that made the difference, that parental presence and, and that exposure was able to counteract those poor language and motor development. So our clinical application is that for um, you know, as that for those of you that are in a nursery with um, still that open bay design, you know, we need to make sure that we're still filtering the environment and environmental modifications to protect that neurosensory progression. And for those of us that are in a single family room, we need to make sure that the babies aren't living in isolation, um, that we're encouraging family involvement, and that um, as neonatal caregivers, that we are talking and singing and reading and holding our babies um, outside of just that every three hour assessment. Of course, we want to protect sleep. Of course, we want to pro protect their um, neurodevelopment, but making sure that we're not doing that in just isolation of, um, in their isolates. That obviously leads easily into our sound exposure section. The Caskey article was great. They found that yes, the more, um, adult talk that infants are exposed to in the NICU, the better their language development is. They did follow up at seven and 18 months. And at seven months, the babies that had higher um, cumulative adult word count in the nursery had better cognitive and language and receptive communication scores. And then at 18 months, they had higher expressive communication scores. The web article and Doni article actually kind of go hand in hand. Both expose babies to audio recordings of their mother's heartbeat and voice. The web article found that at 30 days of life, the infants who had had that exposure to their mom's heartbeat and voice um, actually had much larger bilateral auditory cortex compared to the controls, which were just listened to routine hospital sounds. And the Doni article is really interesting because 
those infants actually served as their own controls. And when listening to their mom's heartbeat and voice, they had fewer cardiopulmonary events. There was a quote I heard after I had my son this fall um, that really struck this point home to me. And it was, no one will ever know the strength of my love for you, for you are the only one that has heard my heartbeat from the inside. So as we get into our less articles for sound exposure, um, Jill Stanley wrote the article you see fit, listed first. It was a meta-analysis that found that, yes, music therapy was great for babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. They found that it was best when it could be live music, and it was started earlier in the NICU stay, which that was defined as less than 1,000 grams or less than 28 weeks. They recommended that it could be used for things like pacification or music reinforcement of sucking. Um, or as part of a multi-layered, multimodal stimulation. And the Drabelli article was just released in 2016. And what that compared was um, when babies were listening to their mom singing lullabies or um, just a recorded lullaby compared to routine hospital sounds and found that their baseline oxygen saturation was actually higher listening to their mom. For a clinical application of this, you know, we really need to educate families and staff to talk to the babies while we're taking care of them. Keep in mind for families, it's hard. You know, once you talk about the weather in your day, it's hard to have a single-sided conversation with a 28-week baby. So bringing in books for them to read, singing to them, you know, it doesn't matter how good they are. You can tell them karaoke of any style is encouraged. Skin-to-skin uh, -skin holding is great. And then as neonatal caregivers, making sure that we're talking, reading, and singing to the babies as you care for them as well. And then possibly even implementing a music therapy program. Skin to skin is really, there's nothing new about skin to skin being supported in the literature. So um, the Bounty article I just wanted to include because it's a great 2016 meta-analysis that says these are the benefits of skin to skin. So of course, lower mortality, increased rates of exclusive breastfeeding amongst many other things. These two articles um, I wanted to include because they just shared some new information that um, I thought was interesting. The Feldman article did follow up um, for the first 10 years of the um, child's life. And at 10 years of age, um, what they found was that those babies that had been held skin to skin had better neuropsychological ability, improved autonomic function, sleep efficiency, improved recovery from stress, and they actually had less autonomic reactions to stress. And those kangaroo care mothers demonstrated greater reciprocity during their interactions. And that's 10 years later. And then the long article compared transitioning a baby into extra uterine life for the first, um, they compared the, that first six hours of transition. And they either had the babies um, skin to skin or they transitioned um, through the resuscitation room and into an isolate. And I should say these babies were between 1,500 and 2,000 grams. But what they found was the babies um, that were skin to skin, they stabilized quicker. And then actually throughout their entire NICU admission, they needed less respiratory support, IV fluids, and antibiotics. So really supporting how early can we get you know, a baby skin to skin with their mom. So skin to skin should be provided as often as possible, as soon as possible, and for as long as possible. And how do we do that? We need to make sure we're creating policies and procedures for staff to follow so that there is a standard procedure for, for everyone. Um, that there's educational competencies to ensure that staff are comfortable with the transfers and positioning. You don't want um, you know, a, a nurse or a respiratory therapist or um, you know, an occupational physical therapist to be there ready to transfer a baby for skin to skin and, and not happen because they just don't feel comfortable handling a 700 gram intubated baby. So competencies really help with that. We also want to make sure we create a comfortable environment for parents so that they enjoy holding their baby. So that's through skin-to-skin -skin chairs possibly, wraps, mirrors, providing water, DVD players. Um, and applying for a grant is a great way to get the funding for those things. So the March of Dimes is a fabulous example of a great place to you know, find financing for different things that you need for your nursery. And then infant massage, both of these articles here are meta-analysis. They um, talk about the benefits. Um, a couple of the main ones that they found was that it improved daily weight gain, and there was improvement in mental scores, decreased response to pain, improved interactions with parents, which we know make a big difference. Um, and then the Galansky article you see listed here looks um, at the impact that infant, ma uh, infant massage has on maternal distress and how infant massage actually helps parents as much as it helps babies. 
And the Han article was a qualitative study that um, looked at teaching moms of babies who were um, experiencing withdrawn NICU and found that um, those moms had improved empowerment and enjoyment, they had better bonding, and they were calmer and more comfortable um, after being taught massage. So what is your knowledge about neonatal massage? You know, massage can help reduce pain before lab draws. It can decrease musculoskeletal tightness. It's a great non-pharmacological intervention for NAS babies. You know, and, and how can you create a, a safe um, neonatal massage program in your NICU? We'll progress into swaddled bathing now. As we continue with the environment of care review, please don't forget that when Shannon started, she started talking about reducing stress and pain as the foundation of providing an appropriate environment of care and knowing that those changes occur really on a cellular level that cause organ deterioration when stress persists. And it's critical for you as a bedside caregiver to understand that and put that into practice. And that's why this article on swaddled bathing is so important because this study published in 2014 really compared 50 infants provided with a conventional bed bath to an immersion swaddled tub bath. And it was a randomized controlled trial and it confirmed that when we swaddled a baby in an immersion tub bath, that they had significantly less stress, shown by less crying, significantly less temperature uh, loss and variability. And we know that temperature loss and, and variation really matters. It's that physiological response that that baby has to maintain temperature, and those wide variations can decrease weight gain and thus affect length of stay, not to mention the stress that the body system um, incurs with that. And so the crying, the flailing, the increased heart rate associated with some of the classic behaviors for when babies are um, bathed, all those stress cues can then be hardwired and cause that maladaptive response or neurological pattern. So clinically, in putting this to practice, um, you know, are you aware of how babies are bathed in your unit? Are we adapting the care based on whether they are 26, 36, or 46 weeks? They should always have a swaddled bath. They should always be flex contained, aligned, and comfortable. They don't need to be immersed every time, but they should certainly have those non-pharmacological benefits of that containment during their bath. And so treating baby or bathing really as a caregiver activity versus a task is crucial to this. It's the intention that can make the change in your approach and therefore affect outcomes. So more specifically in your nursery, looking at what your policies are. Um, you know, is, are the bathings done in an age appropriate manner or are they done the same for a baby who's 26 and 36 weeks? Do babies cry while they're bathed in your nursery and is that just considered part of bathing because it doesn't need to be? Do the babies have cold stress? And if you're a therapist, are you incorporating swaddled tub baths as a therapeutic intervention to improve the neurobehavioral state regulation, the sensory motor integration, you know, decreasing that musculoskeletal tightness. It's really an awesome therapeutic intervention. And you can use swaddle bathing as an ADL education for parents and helping them learn how to bathe their baby in a um, age appropriate manner. So it's really not just that task of cleaning a baby, but it's providing that appropriate and positive touch and interaction, promoting that quiet alertness and decreasing stress. How are your staff oriented on how to provide a bath? Um, do they just get that from the preceptor? Is there any information for both parents and staff that is consistent of how to, of how to provide a swaddled bath? In terms of positioning and handling as an environment of care um, activity, there's a lot of articles related to this. But looking at this article published in 2014, it was a randomized clinical controlled trial from St. Louis Children's um, at Washington University. And they enrolled 100 infants with the mean gestation of 28.7. And they looked at alternative positioning, which was identified for them as using the Dandelru by Dandelion Medical. And they compared that to traditional positioning, which was using like the snuggle ups, bendy bumpers, sleep sacks and or blanket rolls and each of these groups were provided with education on how to use the product 
and then they evaluated the infants using the NNS and the NOMAS with the blind reviewer. And they found that those infants using the Dandelru actually showed less asymmetry at term equivalent regardless if they were less than 28 weeks or older. And we're going to talk in a little bit about um, the implications for asymmetry, but it's huge with outcome. Now this article did show, however, that those with cerebral injury, um, in, in other words, intraventricular hemorrhage, um, that they did poor actually in the RUE with self-regulation. And there was a little bit of um, hypothesized thought that maybe when those infants with cerebral injury had all that nice containment, that when we then unwrapped them, that they didn't have the self-regulation to keep themselves together. And so, um, you know, definitely looking at providing um, every, th or I'm sorry, um, definitely looking at you as a therapist or a nurse, making sure that you're providing that containment and providing what um, care that you can provide from a swaddle containment perspective all during the handling. The next slide, or the next article then, is um, a recent article here in 2016 by Dunser and et al. And it reported in early human development a study including 70 preterm infants born less than 30 weeks, and it looked at head turning preferences at term equivalent and then outcomes on the Bailey scales at two years of age. And they developed an assessment tool with this study um, to identify the degree of head turning preferences, which was actually validated in the study as well. But they reported that while all infants had head turning preference, 77% was to the right and 79% was moderate or severe. And so they found that while head turning can be typical, that strong pushing, loss of range of motion, and increased rotation can all be a marker for adverse developmental outcomes. And they found a correlation using this head turning scale um, with issues in fine motor, self-regulation, and then suboptimal reflexes at two years of age. And they also found that medical status, um, like the need for oxygen past 36 weeks, correlated as well with these um, increased positional preferences. The next article then, um, the NewSync article from 2013, addresses positional preferences and deformational plagiocephaly for infants less than 30 weeks and 1,000 grams. So it's similar patients that were enrolled in this other study. And essentially, those positional preferences of the head occurred in their um, study 66% of the time at term equivalent, 37% at three months, and it decreased to 16% by six months. But likewise, they also looked at deformational plagiocephaly, um, which was present at 30% at term age, 50% at three months, so it actually went up, and then to 23% at six months. It also showed that the chronic lung disease um, or slow, motor, slow gross motor maturation at three months was correlated as a predictor of this persistent uh, deformational plagiocephaly. And then the last group of articles related to positioning um, look at Colette. And these articles were actually done looking at deformational plagiocephaly, but looked at the brain MRIs of these babies at eight months. So there was 20 infants that had the deformational plagiocephaly and 21 controls without it. And they determined that the infants with deformational plagiocephaly had greater asymmetrical and flattening of their posterior brain in their cerebellar vermis and shortening of the corpus callosum along with differences in the orientation of the corpus callosum. So if you've ever wondered if the head shape affects brain shape, it certainly does. Asymmetry and flattening of the brain structures was also associated with worse developmental outcomes on the Bailey Scales of Infant Development 3. And this second study follow-up showed that preschoolers with a history of deformational plagiocephaly continue to receive lower developmental scores um, than those unaffected controls. So differences were largely in cognition, language, and parent reported adaptive behaviors. And actually the smallest problem was in development. So this article wasn't suggesting a cause and effect between def deformational pagiocephaly and developmental risk, but more that deformational pagiocephaly can be a marker of developmental risk and need for early intervention. So from a clinical application for these positioning and handling articles, I think really just identifying for your own nursery, what are your positioning and handling 
protocols and policies? Do you have appropriate products to use for your infants? Do you have enough products or do people end up using blanket rolls because they ran out of products? Do you regularly inventory your products um, and your equipment? Um, what is the process for learning how to use the products? Do they only you know, or learn it from their preceptor? Is a developmental committee or therapy team involved in helping new staff coming on board, making sure that everybody knows how to competently use all of your positioning equipment? Do you have a competency skills checklist for new hires and are you auditing your positioning? Can you say in your nursery that 70% of the babies are positioned with flexion, containment, alignment, and comfort? Is that number 40%, 90%? You know, have you audited those things? Have you stayed open to new products um, for positioning? And certainly the Madlinger Lewis article that I mentioned could be used to help write a grant um, for positioning equipment. Keeping in mind that prolonged head turning um, can impact reflex patterns, movement, muscle tone. Um, it can increase the chance of torticollis and that asymmetrical head shaping and deformational plagiocephaly, even scoliosis. We really you know, keeping in mind that, that head shape affects brain shape and that the infants with deformational plagiocephaly have poor outcomes, we really have to make sure from a professional standpoint that we see the impetus of importance of positioning. Um, you know, really looking at that positioning tool that I mentioned in that article would be a great thing to pull from that article and start looking at your babies more specifically, making sure you're using the gel products, trying to implement quality improvement products to where um, you know, there's less right-sided uh, preference and those kind of things. So in regards to oral feeding, um, this first article was from Chantal Lau. And um, I've got it here because I really want to just encourage you to read this article to get a better idea of how feeding is just not about the lips, the tongue, and the mouth. Um, but really, it's an all-encompassing developmental activity with GI and respiratory components and neurological maturation components. And remember that. Um, 25 to 45 percent of just normal developing children have swallowing or feeding problems and that up to 80 percent of those infants born premature have developmental issues um, or have feeding problems. So really just encorpusing or understanding how important oral feeding is and that the risk is very high for issues and so we have to be careful how we move forward with all of that. Um, the second article is about direct breastfeeding. And um, in this study done in Finland, it followed moms on social media support groups and looked at themes that NICU moms talked about. And they learned that these moms felt that discharge was a priority over successful breastfeeding and that EBM was a priority over um, direct breastfeeding success. They also found that the reality of going home with their breastfeeding baby, didn't, they, they didn't have the problem solving techniques to be successful and that they often tied successful breastfeeding with successful parenting. And therefore, failure at breastfeeding was failure at parenting. And I just want you to really think about that. From an oral feeding standpoint, I would be remiss not to mention this article um, from Wellington and Perlman about infant-driven feeding that showed that infants um, less than 28 weeks reached full nipple feed 17 days sooner and were discharged nine days earlier when the infant-driven feeding model of care was um, put into practice. So from a clinical application standpoint, I think that first article really helps us identify the need for us not to force babies and that we need a practice on our units to help everybody come full circle and realize the importance of feeding. That article about social media really helped us realize the importance of how we communicate with our families. And we want to make sure and look at our own units. Is breastfeeding supported in our nursery? Um, do parents feel like the emphasis of breast milk is more important over breastfeeding? Do we, are we continuously really supporting our moms and helping them make decisions at home and helping them feel um, adequate in all of this? In, from a neonatal therapy standpoint, um, I'm just going to go back and talk just briefly of an article that Shannon mentioned that was actually about single family room design. But in this article, they also talked about developmental support. And developmental support was measured by the number of occupational therapy sessions in which OTs and nurses collaborated on a developmental implementation care plan for the babies. And it was found that this developmental support was one of the mediators that was associated with weight at discharge, rate of weight gain, and differences in attention. So 
Um, likewise, fewer medical procedures, decreased stress, and decreased pain was mediated by the developmental support and maternal involvement. So I think this article um, that Dr. Rosemary Bigsby uh, was involved with is just a valuable tool as a therapist to really show the significant impact that um, therapist and nursing can have together on babies. And it can help, definitely help with supporting um, the therapy role in the nursery. From a parent education standpoint then, um, you know, just realizing that it's huge in the NICU staff and that um, this first article looking at Hyman looks at antepartum education and it actually found that developing a relationship with families prior to the stressors of the NICU admission can help alleviate some of that stress and concern. So this is common in many NICUs for nurses to take a family on a tour if able or go to the antepartum area and show them pictures to kind of familiarize them with the NICU prior to delivery. But within this context, both nursing and or therapy should also be incorporating some of the language that just says, this is what we'll do for your baby, but this is what you as a parent can do for your baby. You can pump your, um, you know, you can provide express breast milk. You can provide that colostrum and help them understand the importance of that, the importance and benefits of skin to skin. Um, the long-term implications for their presence in the NICU after the baby's born. When we talk about parent education too, I think we really want to look at um, you know, that feeling of being pushed towards length of stay. And as we look at that push of length of stay, there was a nice article done in India that I want to mention where they had a control group where infants were discharged between 1,800 and 2,200 grams, and then a group where infants were discharged at 1,500 grams. And essentially, they looked at those babies at three months and found that there was a statistically um, significant difference in emergency room visits, but there was not a difference in readmissions or death. And so the thought within this article and their discussion was that if we do better follow-up education and discharge teaching to prepare the family, um, maybe even some home visits kind of a thing, might be a way to continue to send these babies home early and yet support them more so that they know what decisions to make and don't need to go to the emergency room as much. From a staff education standpoint, there was a nice article um, looking at transitioning, I'm sorry, a nice article by Elizabeth Jensen that looked at the nurse to nurse education worked really well for staff buy-in for positioning babies better and more consistently. So nursing was able to um, provide that education during their everyday activities um, as they're already doing it, so it didn't disrupt their daily caregiving. And they found that having a team go around and do audits um, was also helpful in that when they did those audits, they provided some of the hands-on correction and positioning at that time. And that when the staff then saw firsthand what a difference that proper positioning can create, witnessing that change in heart rate and comfort and sleeping and relaxation of the baby, that that was motivating to the staff to change how they do what they do. Another study related to staff education was by um, Karen Hendricks Munoz, and she looked at a um, training program that was provided on kangaroo care. And that um, seven and a half hour program was provided to really increase the confidence and willingness to assist with um, kangaroo or skin to skin. And it included lecture material as well as kind of a lab um, to practice with, with mannequins or dolls to help with um, different acuity levels. And they found that after the education and the simulation, the staff competency increased from 30% to 92%. And that when practice um, with the intubation and ventilated babies, their discomfort providing kangaroo care dropped to zero. And that their actual practice of skin to skin for eligible babies increased from 26 to 85%. So in terms of clinical application, looking at what your role with parent and staff education, that a lot of parent education needs to happen to help those moms with feeding and bathing and positioning and caregiving and promoting development is huge. And helping them identify their infant's cues and cries and stress and how to comfort and identify their real medical issues. And that preparing them to solve problems for a life at home. Remembering that you might have taught some, somebody something 10 times or 10 times that day you've said the same thing. But it might be new to this mom, or maybe it's not going to sit, stick, sink in until like the fourth time you've said it. So it's okay to repeat it, and we have to do that. 
and then getting involved in staff education at the bedside and finding ways to really bring in speakers for your whole staff to participate in labs and having um, knowledge and better confidence and competence and skills through that positioning, skin to skin, neuroprotective care, massage, whatever it is that you need to um, improve your education for your staff about. So we've talked a lot about environment of care and I just want to move forward for the next few minutes and talk a little bit more specifically about some of the infant parent relationship and the literature for that. So hopefully you're familiar with um, this study done in 2013 by Renegals and it looked at parental presence um, with 81 infants and the infants were under 30 weeks and basically found that through the, um, the NIST, the NICU Network Neurobehavioral Scale, that those infants that had more parental presence or visitation by their family had better quality of movements, less arousal, less excitability, more lethargy, and more hypertonia. And that more holding was associated with improved quality of movements, less stress, less arousal, and less excitability. And what's amazing about this study is that these differences were found just by term age. So it really um, is an awesome concept to realize all of the changes that can happen just by parental presence. And for 36 weeks post-term, it was observed that maternal positive affective verbalizations in the NICU were associated with those same parenting behaviors at two years of age. So their social support, their socioeconomic status, and being born in the late preterm period being factors that were associated with this. Another study then um, that was done by Rosemary White Trout and Diane uh, Davis looked at 240 mothers and it was a randomized controlled study as well looking at both kangaroo care and massage and they found that um, with kangaroo care that there was social behaviors and developmental maturity that was increased when the moms provided the kangaroo care. When the moms provided massage, the moms actually reported a decline in their maternal depression symptoms and that doing both skin to skin and massage both lowered their parental, uh, their parental stress. In terms of other parental experiences, this study looked at reducing the early maternal separation that interferes with that pattern of mother-infant interaction um, like verbal soothing and breastfeeding odor and heat exchange, eye contact, and really knowing that from those animal model studies that that maternal separation alters stress responsivity, cognitive, social, and emotional function. And so in this study, Welch describes the Family Nurturing Intervention, or FNI, as a new intervention designed to really overcome those maladaptive conditioning effects of maternal separation and the NICU environment on the premature infants. So it was hypothesized um, to do this, they needed to facilitate an emotional connection and establish an adaptive classical kind of homeostatic conditioning routine between the mother and the infant um, to help with that calming cycle. And so the emotional connection was completed through the scented cloth exchange between the mother and the baby. They were, the mothers were kind of taught how to talk to their infant, how to make eye contact, to do skin to skin, um, and so with this group, these, these infants actually showed improved Bailey scales um, of development um, outcomes in both cognition and language scores when compared to the cohort that did not have this. And these were done at 18-month follow-up. Um, but the um, nurturing intervention group also had few, fewer attention problems on the child behavioral checklist. And um, so really looking at your implications for this, um, for practice, you know, are you a, providing things like a snuggle doll or something with mom's smell? Are you making sure that there's plenty of skin to skin? Are you really teaching mom how to provide that eye contact and those talking to them and all of those simple activities that we think of so simple and yet are we really giving the one-on-one -on -one support for this family in the moment with their baby to help them parent their child? I think it's extremely important. When we look at um, supporting parents, there's just a host of articles here um, that are so important and um, these were all from the Journal of Perinatology and I just really recommend that you just get this whole journal um, and it really provides by Hall and Heinemann all of the recommendations for psychosocial, psychosocial support in the NICU. But there was a follow-up then article that was just done by Hall 
um, that was just done in, in 2016, and it actually identified the top 10 recommendations from that neonatal or National Perinatal Association work group, and identified um, what some of the policy recommendations, the parent to peer support groups, social work and psychology requirements, um, lots of different things, as well as um, even the need for staff yearly education about um, psychosocial needs of parents and how to meet those needs. What I um, really specifically liked about this article, too, is it really talked a lot about the quality improvement process. And it takes you through that process of looking at your pre-assessment or audit, getting staff involved, developing a task force, developing that mission and vision statement to support the culture of care, and um, you know, discussed the PDSA, or Plan, Do, Study, Act process to really change um, care in your unit. The O'Brien article then um, was a study released in 2013 examining the feasibility, safety, and potential outcomes for the family integrated care model. And so um, eligible infants were, there were 42 of them, and this was a Canadian study, um, for infants born less than 35 weeks, and they, um, you know, were on CPAP or less from a respiratory standpoint. And essentially, families were encouraged to be there for at least eight hours a day, and they were provided with the educational sen um, sessions and then mentored by the nurse. So these parents were actually the ones providing most of the care for their babies. They were, you know, feeding them, they were suctioning them, they were positioning them, they were holding them skin to skin. And they found that these infants um, had a significantly better weight gain in this family integrated care group, and that there was significant increase in breastfeeding at discharge. They also found that on the parental stress survey that those in, the, um, in this FIC model had decreased, significantly decreased stress from the first day of enrollment. Um, a few more studies in terms of involving families then is just looking at this qualitative descriptive design based on a semi-structured in, uh, interviews conducted by um, mothers and fathers. And it, it looked at skin to skin and their active involvement in the infant's care, and it really identified that parents had an increased sense of control and need to stay increased in their presence to feel needed, to feel like a parent. The opportunity to stay overnight was um, certainly helpful in that. They also identified that high noise and light levels and dismissive staff attitudes were obstacles to uh, parental presence. So probably no real surprise to that. Um, I almost forgot this Fleck article, but it's new, 2016, on the bottom of your slide there. And this um, article really does a great job clearly defining the critical components needed for caregivers to partner with the parents and to help parents assume their roles as parents. So it reviews the process of attachment, the components of maternal sensitivity, and that synchrony between mother and infant, the infant's regulation, organization, temperament, the effects of maternal stress, and even um, the mindfulness of the mother. So it really talks a lot about, um, you know, kind of the attachment that we sometimes just overlook. And this article really um, confirms that delayed neurodevelopmental outcomes of preterm infants are influenced by that mother-infant interaction and attachment. And that continuous interplay of sensory, visual, and tactile perceptual cues between that mom and infant are really critical for engagement and regulation. And that positive mother-infant interactions facilitate that development of an infant's social competency and secure attachment for adequate language development. So that's a lot of information that we've gone over, a lot of articles. And so um, now that you've heard the information, where do you go from here? And I think one thing is to just take a hard look at your own knowledge. Um, and you know, are there areas where from this literature that you need to go back and really reread it and, and get a better sense of your knowledge base in that area? Are there areas from a skill development area that you need to go back and become a better expert for your team in that area? whether that's skin to skin or massage or positioning or whatever that might be. What areas are you the most passionate about? What areas do you, Nick, you really need you to, to look at change the most? Um, do you have any data to start with? And I think looking at data is a great way to start this process. Where are you in your nursery with auditing skin to skin or massage or swaddle bathing or parent involvement? We need to measure it so that we can move forward and um, show improvement in that area. And then 
one thing I'd really recommend you do from this talk is find out where your passion in your area is. You know, you're going to identify um, what you want to do, what your measure is, what you plan um, to improve, and then develop an elevator speech for that. And by an elevator speech, I just mean like a little one minute kind of pre-thought out talk that you might do when you've got the opportunity, you're on the elevator and your manager jumps on with you. You know, so for example, um, if all of a sudden my NICU manager jumps on, um, then I might just, you know, say, hey, can we set up a time to talk about staff education, um, you know, on positioning equipment. I've done an audit in our nursery and it appears that only 40% of the time the developmental equipment is being optimally used. And I think if we provide an hour in service and some competency check off this year, that we can really maximize the effectiveness of the equipment. And that the literature suggests that positioning can change outcomes, decrease stress, um, and help improve weight gain, decrease risk of infection. So can we set up a time to get together for that? Um, so that's just one example. Or you might um, you know, be interested in purchase, purchasing info, um, education and or products for skin to skin. And so you might have that conversation that, you know, in doing an audit, you found out that, you know, we've got a 20% accidental extubation rate during um, skin to skin. And, and quote the literature that according to Hendricks and Muno's study, that that can decrease to zero and that we can actually increase the skin to skin practice for eligible infants from 26% to 85%. Um, and I'd love to discuss this further with you. Can we set up a time for that? So it's really using this information to just come full circle and um, move forward so that we can change habits in our unit as well. So I thank you so much for attending this webinar. Um, Shannon, I hope that you felt our passion and were able to learn a lot about the evidence-based medicine um, that we provided related to um, the environment of care and infant partnerships, and we hope it'll help guide your practice. We have not yet um, put the reference list within this uh, presentation, so if you would like to email, the, red for, the email is right there, Kara Wainsman, Infant Driven, and I'll be happy to send you the reference list. And we'll be happy to take questions now. Awesome. Uh, Carrie Ann and Shannon, thank you so much. We absolutely feel your passion and what a great resource for everyone to have the most up-to-date references and a synopsis of what they say. So, I mean, that was an amazing, amazing webinar. Um, as Carrie Ann said, we're going to open up for questions right now. So please type any questions you have in the chat box on the lower left part of your screen and uh, the girls will do their best to answer as many as we can. So um, thanks, Kathy, for doing that. So just really quickly, Kara, Shannon, that was amazing. And I'm just seeing in the chat area, people are echoing the same thing. Awesome. Um, so there was a couple questions here. So I thought I would um, maybe start um, with the, um, yeah, so people are saying amazing, amazing. Um, so Kara, I think it was during your part, there was the question about the Feldman article with the skin to skin in the 10 year outcomes, and they were asking if maybe you could give a little more detail, if you know it, um, about maybe how old the kids were when they started skin to skin, how long they were held per day. You know, I think people are trying to get out, is there a dose response? Is it kind of American style, you know, kangaroo a couple hours a day, or what was the um, dose effect on that one? Yep, and actually, um, thanks, Kathy. That was um, from my section. And so, so I'm glad you asked because I think that is one of the coolest articles that we we touched on. And I, of course, you just want to share so much about every article. But um, so the way that that study worked is there were uh, they enrolled 146 preterm infants at 32 weeks postmenstrual age, and um, the, the the test subjects so they received skin to skin holding for one hour per day for 14 consecutive days. And then the controls, they received um, routine incubator only care. And so then they did developmental follow-up. They actually did it at um, three, six, 12, and 24 months. And they did it at five years and 10 years. And so the um, six months to 10 year follow-up, they actually, so they had um, improved autonomic functioning, maternal attachment, reduce maternal anxiety and enhance child cognitive development and executive function. And then that 10 year follow up showed that um, better neuropsychological ability, um, that autonomic function, sleep efficiency, all those other things that we touched on. Um, so that's, that's what it was, which I thought was so cool was, you know, the 
no, there's not to say that those babies didn't continue to receive skin to skin after the study was over or prior to, but the, the study that they looked at was they definitely got at least one hour per day for 14 consecutive days. Wow, thanks. Um, the other question came in here at the end, which was um, really related to the massage, and um, I don't know if you can see it in the chat area too, um, about um, olive oil, sunflower, or no oil for um, massage, and it was the 2016 Cook article, and I'm not sure, they're just asking if you have any comments on that study. I don't know if Shannon or or Kara, either one of you want to address that? So I know with that article, um, my understanding, so it was, it was a pilot study, I believe, and they found that um, both the oils, I want to say they improved um, hydration and significantly less improvement in the lipid structure compared to the no oil group. Um, and that is consistent with some other research that was released a couple years ago. Um, so. There was an article in 2013 by Fala that looked at um, sunflower oil versus no oil um, and seeing improved weight gain. They've also done research that has looked at um, using safflower oil and, um, and coconut oil. So there's, there's other things that are in it. Um, overall, though, the, the general consensus with the research that we've seen is that using um, an oil does um, impact or improve that weight gain. They're actually finding that it's being absorbed um, subcutaneously, like through the skin, and that, that triglyceride um, is, is impacting that weight gain. And um, But I do know that there is also research to suggest that um, olive oil is detrimental um, to the skin. It actually causes breakdown. I don't believe that the Cook article that was just released found that similar finding, but there, there is research to suggest that using olive oil on um, infant skin is not a good idea. Thanks. Tara, did you want to add anything, or does that cover? No, I thought she did great. Um, okay. And I, I do want to mention, I just saw this um, one about humidity, and I get asked that so much, so I just want to mention it. One of the questions yep. is, um, in if babies are still in humidity, at what point do you recommend initiating skin-to-skin -skin holding? And I just want to mention that a mom's chest has 50% humidity. So we often think that, you know, we're taking them out of this 50% humidity incubator and putting them into a dry mommy. But if a mommy actually has 50% humidity, then we can be less worried about that. So I just wanted to mention that. Absolutely. I think that's a really good point. Um, there was a question about um, recommendations for any infant massage courses in Europe. Maybe I can um, send you the chat and you guys can maybe um, chat offline about that. Um, in all of your review of the literature, there was a question about whether or not there's any um, mention of fluidized positioners and their value. Did, was there any articles that specifically mentioned that? Um, of the articles that we um, reviewed, there weren't, but um, I do believe that, um, you know, for the people who don't know what we're talking about, it's the Z-Flow pro um, product, um, also the fluidized um, positioners is what they're called. I know on their website they have some um, references that they might have um, that are a little bit older, but none that I know of that have been published in the last um, four years, which is the literature that we were looking at. Um, people are um, commenting on, um, you know, you guys talked a lot about mother involvement, involvement and the impact on that, and they're just making the comment, is there any research um, for the fathers or any maybe potential differences to babies' reactions and outcomes um, related to which of the parents are at the bedside, or is there truly something unique about what the mother offers? Yeah, that's an awesome question, and actually I would refer um, people back to that um, uh, National Perinatal Association journal that I mentioned um, because it has so many articles and it does talk specifically about dad's involvement and mom's involvement and breaks down recommendations for that and um, you know supporting both the mother and the father specifically based on their needs so that would be an awesome reference for anybody interested in that um, topic. 
There's um, a question about baby wearing and using baby carriers in the NICU to maybe, you know, offer some of that um, connection time for babies. What do you guys think? Do you have any opinions or any references about that? I think that's becoming a more and more hot topic as uh, maybe we have some of our um, uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome babies. Um, I think, you know, more and more people are trying to figure out ways from a non-pharmacological standpoint to help those infants. And I don't know of any um, literature available on that. I think from a recommendation standpoint, we want to make sure that if we are carrying a baby um, as a practice in the nursery, that we're doing so in baby carriers and not using for example, a skin-to-skin -skin wrap that was not designed to carry the baby um, from a safety standpoint. I think we just legally have to be really careful about some of those kind of things. So I'm obviously of the thought that I'd rather have a baby being carried and worn than in any kind of a container um, on the floor. So I'd rather a baby being worn than being in a swing or a infant seat or a car seat or any of those kind of things. It just becomes a... Um, difficulty making that policy in your unit, I think, and figuring out the practice for that from an infection control standpoint and an accessibility um, standpoint for staff that are then wearing the baby, as well as what product we use to wear the baby um, in order to be helpful with that. Cool. Um, there's a question about um, swaddled bathing and guidelines on how early the you know, how early in gestation would you offer bottled bathing? And um, what about umbilical cord on, off? What have you guys experienced with the research that's out there on that? Great. So for that, I would, um, well, first of all, let's just clarify that swaddled bathing should happen um, any time a baby is being bathed, whether they're, a, you know, a three-week-old former 24-week baby. Um, they should always be swaddled. I'm assuming that we're talking more about an immersion swaddled bath, so a tub bath, um, a swaddled, you know, immersion or tub bath of when that should happen. Um, according to the A1 guidelines, and I believe they were published either in 2013 or 2014, um, I believe that um, the A1 guidelines suggest that about 32 weeks is when the skin is mature enough for the baby to be immersed in water. And that is also when they talk about to be able to be using products and those kind of things. And I would just refer I to the A1 guidelines. I love that clarification, too. I love the clarification between providing swaddling, containment, support during all bathing experiences, and then specifically addressing, like, immersion bathing as a separate situation. I think we kind of put all those together, and all baths should be swaddled as as all handling caregiving should be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a question, um, it looks like um, from Anne, Annie. It says, um, I think it's Kathy Philbin or Kathy Philbin, um, used to say that no music for babies in the NICU. And now we're reading that singing and other kind of auditory stuff is good. So is it that we've learned some new stuff? Is there something specific about the old music research that now we know to do differently? Or, or how do we rectify kind of our old way of thinking with this, this new data? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So um, Stan Graven and, and Kathleen Philbin's work back in 2008 um, when it was published was certainly um, new to that time period, and it was through NIH grants that we were able to look and identify the recommendations for that. Keep in mind that was back in the day um, prior to that when people were even putting the recordings up to mommy's bellies and, you know, putting the earphones on for um, prenatal, um, you know, sound as well. Since that time, what we have learned is from our neonatal certified music therapist, and so that is becoming a... Um, a field where we have now recognized in the NICU that they have a, an, an extreme amount of information regarding this, and there's a special certification that these music therapists have regarding um, neonatal music therapy. And from those research studies, and um, certainly Dane, Jane Stanley is one of those, she's got a book and you can look at a lot of her articles, there's a lot of stuff online that is more current information regarding um, mother's voice and sounds and lullabies and um, it's just a whole nother area of research that has really expanded in the last probably six years. And so um, definitely our recommendations are changing a little bit. 
I also think the fact that we have digital music now instead of those little cassette tapes that went ee when they were um, playing is making a difference. Um, I know um, Women's Brigham's Hospital has done some research related to this. So there's certainly a lot of new research coming out that is helping us understand more specifically what our babies can um, do better with. And while we used to think that you know, it should be an orchestra kind of music. Now we've learned, as Shannon says, one voice, one instrument. Um, and I think that there's a lot to be learned from the music therapists who have that neonatal certification. Would you say there's any strict guidelines of, of when to begin or when to not begin? Or would you say it's always, you know, pacing it off of the baby individualizing? 100% individualizing and there are different parameters for different ages um, and they talk specifically about 55 decibels or less um, and making sure that if you're providing then this individual baby A in um, music therapy then that if you provide it at under 55 decibels that it's not then providing stimulation to baby B which is you know in that same pod so to speak. Um, so and um, I can refer you to there was a uh, special topic call webinar that was um, provided I believe last two maybe two Tuesdays ago by Nant the National Association of Neonatal Therapists um, they had a webinar that specifically had a um, neonatal certified music therapist and so you might want to go back and see if you can listen to that if you're interested and I think she provided a lot of the updated information on that fantastic um, maybe our final um, question um, it's kind of more of a practical one, maybe just any solutions you or Shannon have. Um, there's just a couple different people who've made mention of the damage that happens to our developmental supportive products during washing. And either you're you know, outsourcing it to specialty laundry or having to send it down to your typical you know, hospital laundry. Any great tricks or great solutions that you have for people who are challenged with you know, feeling like they're replacing things really quickly or have just had this experience. I love this person said, it looks like somebody washed all of our stuff with forks. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I totally can visualize that. But do you have any suggestions, practical things where people are having this, this really, you know, challenge with laundry? Yes, it's um, funny timing because I'm actually going to one of our other hospitals to talk to the laundry person there uh, because we have lost some of our stuff as well. I think the important thing is as much as possible having your own washer and dryer so that the laundry doesn't go out is certainly optimal. Yes, of course, there are strict guidelines about um, you know making sure that your dryer vents outside and all of those kind of things, doing a Clorox wash and all of those kind of things um, in your protocols and policies for doing that, but certainly worth it if you're able to have your own washer and dryer versus sending it out. I think from a um, standpoint of keeping things look fresh as well is that when you've got a product, regardless of the product, if it's got Velcro on it, asking your staff that before they put it in the laundry bag to simply fold the Velcro on itself so that it's not attaching to all the other items in the laundry. Um, you know, it's Velcro as well, and that makes a huge difference in being able to maintain the integrity um, of all of your stuff because then it's not being adhered by all the other Velcro. Using bags when appropriate for some of the smaller items, you know, laundry bags so that they stay a little bit more intact as well. And um, while I know it's a source of frustration and even an expense, I think we have to also look at the research and show that developmental products do help. And so we need to just really hone in what our individual hospital policy issues are and, um, and what our policies are and how we can rectify that so that our loss is minimized and we can maintain that, um, you know, inventory. Sometimes we don't inventory often enough and then all of a sudden we realize where we don't have products and everything's gone away and we're kind of um, behind the eight ball figuring out how that happened. So I'm um, just staying on it a little bit more and watching the process as it goes, we can get a better idea of where the laundry is going. Um, this think, is Kathy. Yeah, I just have one more thing, one more thing to add to the laundry situation is oftentimes if you will take the time to go and meet with the person who's actually in charge of the laundry, they have no idea that what they're doing is so important to babies. So either inviting them up to your unit or having a meeting with them, even if it's a centralized laundry in the city, 
just giving them a better understanding. Most laundries do have smaller washer and dryers. They just don't like to use them because they're not as economical. But we've um, had really good luck with people trying to engage the laundry personnel in being part of, you know, doing good things for babies. So try that as well because laundry is probably the number one problem out there. So appreciate those questions. I think that was the last question. Um, we, again, thanks everyone for staying on longer. I mean, there were so many good questions and so much great information. Um, if you're, in order to receive your free CE, you will need to fill out the webinar evaluation. So in the chat area, you can click on the evaluation link, or once we're finished, you'll be immediately redirected to the evaluation form if your firewall allows. At the end of the evaluation form, you will receive a link to the CE certificate. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital has blocked access, you will receive an email within the next day or so with a link to the evaluation as well as a link to the recording and a PDF of the slides. Just one um, thing, if, you're vi if you are viewing this as a group, you must each log into the evaluation form in order to get a CE that's just for you. So I hope that you'll all visit the Dandelion Medical website for future webinars, and we also have links to the recordings of our previous 24 webinars that are all still active and available for continuing education credits. Um, I specifically want to thank Carrie Ann and Shannon so much for a really, really well thought out, informative presentation. You, Again, your passion and your knowledge really shone through. So thanks, everybody, for listening, and we will see you at our next webinar in September.